So, um, I'm studying in Vashina today, my name's Julia, um, and I know Nicole through working in Poland every now and again. Um, so, Paul, Nicole is at the Polish Academy of Sciences, right? Um, and is a, hang on, I've, I've lost that piece of, um, anyway, um, describes herself as an anthropologist and a sociolinguist, um, working on issues to do with the um, um, acquisition, the, 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 uh, um, the word? transmission um, and, and uh, maintenance of minority languages, particularly in Europe, but also you know, in general. Um, and you work particularly on, at the moment you're working in Lusatia on the Sorbian language, um, which is a minority language in Germany. And also worked uh, in, in Wales, in Kashubia, um, and in Britain. In Britain. <laughs> okay. well, anyway, so, welcome. Thanks. So I will um, measure my time not to uh, speak too, uh, too long. So thank you very much for inviting me here and it's a real pleasure to present you some of my thoughts concerning the assessment of ethnolinguistic vitality. I hope my English will not be too bad <laughs> so you can understand everything and I hope that I will be able also to understand your questions. And so, so the first part would be about uh, some existing databases and scales of uh, language endangerment and of assessment of ethnolinguistic vitality. And then I will share with you some of my uh, thoughts concerning uh, methodological and uh, also ethical problems um, when dealing with the assessment of ethnolinguistic vitality. And it will be based on my personal research experience uh, the research project I carried out with uh, Dr. Claudia Soria from uh, Italian um, National Research Center in Pisa. So as uh, you all know for sure, uh, the recent years uh, there is a really grown up and important rise in the significance of the notion of language endangerment. And it is not only in scientific papers that you can read about it or hear about it, but we can hear about it from everywhere. There are many different um, um, popular magazines or uh, some papers concerning its uh, programs in radio or in television, so we can hear it from all around that there are many languages that are being endangered and uh, there is also the danger of their death. So um, when, it's, uh, when, it, when it became popular, there is also a need to present it in such a way that people are touched about it, so that they start to care about uh, the fact that many of languages are endangered. So uh, also many pronostics uh, concerning the moment of language death uh, have been created. And there are a lot of papers telling that, for example, for the Sorbian language or Sorbian languages, which are uh, one of my uh, research um, uh, subject, uh, that, for example, the lower Sorbian will be dead within the next 10 years. Uh, but, and this is something that is important for me as a researcher and something I would like to share with you, I, um, it's the fact that all these pronostics have also um, influence on uh, these languages' condition. And uh, uh, I think that from the point of view of language revitalization, it is really important. And for us as the researchers, because most of, our, uh, most of us here are uh, uh, somehow are, or linguists or people dealing with uh, um, uh, languages. So uh, we also have to keep it in mind, mind that um, what we do and how we do it and how we present it uh, have also impact on uh, the object of our uh, studies. So um, there are a lot, uh, maybe not a lot, but some uh, databases and uh, scales of language endangerment that became popular and that became the reference resources for language endangerment and also for finding evidence of the risk of extinction of actually any given language. And when these kind of scales or databases want to embrace all the possible languages that uh, exist in the world, of course, most of them are oversimplified 
and uh, they are not taken with the necessary caveats and uh, especially exceptions. And here's uh, one example that is really deep in my mind, uh, as I, I told you before, I, I'm studying Sorbian languages. Uh, for example, in the UNESCO World's Atlas, of um, the Atlas of the World's Languages in Danger, there is only one Sorbian language. Even if there are two, they are described as one language. And uh, moreover, uh, Upper Sorbian and Lower Sorbian find themselves in totally different um, situation. One of them, the Upper Sorbian, uh, have um, like uh, maintained uh, intergenerational transmission, and there is a group of about 10, maybe 12,000 people who are using this language in all uh, age. Uh, I mean, there are children who communicate with their parents and grandparents. Um, uh, but for lower Sorbian, the situation is very different. And there are all, only some older people who know this language, but who have little occasion to communicate within themselves. So even according to these scales, those two languages should be uh, like described uh, as uh, finding themselves in a different uh, situation, but they are not. So, um, but anyway, all this, uh, the, these databases or these uh, scales serves uh, as, uh, as the reference for uh, all the languages. And now I would like to tell you something, how they are constructed and what, they, uh, what it means uh, different level and uh, this uh, um, grades of uh, language endangerment. So this is the most uh, uh, famous, I would say, uh, EGIT scale, which is based on the scale uh, uh, constructed by or created by Joshua Fishman, um, uh, but extended. <laughs> And uh, so there are uh, levels from 0 to 10 with 2, 6 and 2, uh, 8 um, grades, so 13 altogether, um, showing uh, what does it mean uh, that the language is uh, in, um, uh, in what kind of state the language uh, is. So uh, we start from what is below, so from 10th level. When the language is extinct, of course, no one retains a sense of ethnic identity associated with the language, even for symbolic purposes. So here I would say that it is important how it is described because when we, uh, and that it is uh, distinct between extinct language and dormant language, um, because when there is, when people uh, within the community do not have the sense of uh, uh, having connection with the language or they do not feel really that the language serves them for any kind of occasion, uh, it means also that uh, there is a lack of potential speakers, of those who could uh, become like a new speakers of the language uh, in, a, in a good uh, condition. So dormant language is the language which have this potentiality uh, even if uh, it is not uh, spoken uh, by people, but it exists some relations or some symbolic uh, uh, meaning of this language. It can serve as a, like, uh, like it is described here, as a heritage identity for people. Now, 2.8, so uh, level 8, uh, 8b and uh, 8a, nearly extinct at moribund. Uh, the difference here is uh, like, uh, like in the example of um, uh, lower Sorbian, which I would say uh, uh, should be described like nearly extinct. Uh, so there are only um, older speakers uh, who know this language but have little opportunity to, uh, to use it uh, uh, because, for example, they do not live uh, in the same village or uh, they are afraid to use this language or they forgot uh, or, or they, they like have another um, practices or habits uh, to, to use this language. And the language which is moribund, it means that um, uh, it is also used by other people but uh, um, they are active in using it. Then um, shifting language, like the most uh, probably, this is this stage which is uh, the most problematical for, uh, for languages when the childbearing generation can use the language among themselves, but they do not normally transmit it to their children. 
uh, but also it means that the generation of children possess kind of uh, even uh, passive knowledge of the language when hearing their parents using it. So there is still this kind of possibility to, uh, to reverse uh, language shifts, to, uh, to, to change uh, this path going to language extinction. 2.6, uh, uh, threatened languages uh, and vigorous languages, they all uh, both to um, uh, concern uh, the, uh, the languages which are used orally, uh, only orally, and uh, one of them, um, um, like the uh, oral use of the language is, uh, is full, is, uh, the situation is sustainable. In the situation where some of uh, um, possibilities to use this language uh, is lacking, uh, we can say that uh, the situation is getting worse. But what is uh, important here that um, the when constructing this scale, um, I, I've got the feeling, especially when, uh, when we will go to, to other points, other levels, that it is also the Western perspective that is taken uh, to describe uh, the situation of languages. That is not really uh, taking into consideration those languages which uh, exist in oral forms or these communities which do not really use or need to uh, the, the written forms of languages uh, as it is uh, described here, the developing language, so the level 5 would be uh, the language which uh, is in oral use also but have also um, uh, the literacy forms uh, in the developing it is not sustainable in the educational level, so level 4 um, uh, the liter literacy uh, is, uh, uh, there is a transmission of literacy, uh, especially in formal education, which is also interesting because we do not have here any uh, reference to other forms of education, only formal education, which also means that there must be a kind of a school or institutional uh, education and uh, any kind of uh, transmission other than uh, official institutional, so the Western uh, uh, education uh, is like of lesser um, value. And uh, then we've got from, from, from level three to level zero uh, different forms of um, languages that are, let's say, saved. Uh, wider communication, level three, uh, the, the language is widely used in work and mass media, but without official status uh, to transcendent language differences across a region. And this is the first time we talk about any kind of language status or recognition of the language. So uh, it is also important uh, that um, uh, it, is, uh, uh, it is not taken as the most necessary um, factor of, um, of the language condition and then from provincial, national to international uh, so um, it um, refers to the different range of uh, the use uh, of, um, of the language. So as I said at the beginning, concerning this uh, kind of scale um, the lower Sorbian language would uh, find, uh, find itself at the 8B level because Actually, when speaking about native speakers, uh, there are only elderly people who know this language, but they rarely communicate between themselves in this language. But there were a lot of um, efforts to revitalize this language, different pro programs that uh, have been launched to, um, uh, to revitalize uh, Lower Sorbian. So we've got also children who are learning this language at school in immersion programs and in bilingual education. There are also different forms of cultural and informal uh, education which should be taken into consideration. During last few years, um, um, we can speak about a very small but uh, existing group of new speakers of Lower Sorbian. So actually, it would be very difficult to say where exactly, uh, having this kind of description, the lower Sorbian, Sorbian um, should be placed. 
So let's now go to the UNESCO scale, which uh, concentrates itself most only on transmission of the language. So we've got safe uh, languages which are spoken by all generation and uh, where the intergenerational transmission is uninterrupted. Vulnerable, most children speak the language but it may be restricted to certain domains like home. Definitely endangered, children no longer learn the language as mother tongue in the home. <laughs> Severely endangered, language is spoken by grandparents and older generation while, while the parents' generation may understand it, they do not speak it to children or among themselves. Critically endangered, the youngest speaker are grandparents and older, as they speak the language partially or infrequently extinct, there are no speakers left. And according to these scales, and having in mind that UNESCO recognized only the Sorbian language and not Upper Sorbian and Lower Sorbian, uh, it is placed here as uh, in general, Sorbian language is definitely endangered, which may be uh, like uh, um, a description of Upper Sorbian, but I'm not sure about uh, the Lower Sorbian language. So, uh, what do we have, uh, like conditions of language vitality according to these uh, scales? Um, in Egypt scales, for sure, the most important is intergenerational transmission. There are also domains of use, but especially education and especially literacy, so the formal education. We don't really have status. It is only mentions once, uh, mentioned once uh, when, uh, when speaking about the official recognition, but we don't have anything concerning the prestige of the language. We don't have anything which would concern the attitudes of people toward this language. And we've got a territorial range of the language. It seems that in the scale of UNESCO there is only a transmission of the language that matters, but when um, um, looking at uh, factors of uh, uh, ethnolinguistic vitalities that are leading to this scale, the sixth great scale I showed you before, we can see that it is uh, quite different. So there are nine um, factors that are taken into consideration when assessing ethnolinguistic vitality um, uh, uh, in UNESCO meaning. Uh, the first factor is, of course, intergenerational transmission, and uh, it is quite obvious when there is no speaker, the language is extinct, so the grade zero, and then um, uh, when it is used by all the age groups, it is grade five, so safe. <coughs> uh, the second factor is the absolute number of speakers, so the total number of people who use the language. And here I, I have to tell, say that I've got a problem with, uh, with this factor. I mean, um, of course, when we deal with a very small community, uh, it is easier uh, or faster that the, the process of language shift can, um, uh, uh, can have place or uh, the total shift of the language. But um, on the other hand, um, UNESCO, th there are different uh, papers which states that, well, we can speak about the language when it, it is safe only when the number of speakers is uh, higher than 100,000 um, people who use this language. But uh, the medium for languages, uh, it is 10,000 speakers, and as we know, most of the language of the world are, world are uh, endangered. But, um, for example, for Upper Sorbian language, I will, I will speak uh, today a lot about, uh, upper, uh, about Sorbian languages. Uh, as, I, as I said before, the, in, uh, the transmission of this language is safe and there are children who use this language and uh, uh, like you can go there and communicate only in uh, Upper Sorbian if you know with whom uh, to, uh, to talk. And um, there are other languages much, much bigger where uh, in, in the situation is, uh, uh, wh wh where the transmission of the language uh, do not exist or it is uh, threatened. And uh, um, so the situation of this language 
can uh, uh, can develop, can be changed um, much quicker than in the case of uh, of small languages. So. Um, this is this is one factor that is uh, treated as a very important by UNESCO, but I'm not really sure if uh, if I do agree with this totally. Uh, the third factor, proportion of speakers within the total population, so from no speakers grade zero to all members of the community who are the speakers of the language grade five. But here, um, one more time, I would add not only the proportion of the speakers within the community, so those who feel themselves members of community, but also the proportion of speakers of the language within the whole society or the whole community which uh, inhabits um, uh, the, the, the region or territory where the, the minority or endangered language exists. Because even if there is a small community within which um, most of people use the language, but they create a very small group who communicates all the time with people who are not uh, um, uh, this language speakers, uh, in most of domains they would have to use the dominant uh, language. So it is also needed to take into consideration how um, uh, um, the language practices among people from uh, belonging to the community looks like when dealing with uh, people from outside of the community. Then trends in existing language domains, so where and with whom is the language used and for what range of topics and of course uh, when uh, it, is, it is quite clear that if uh, the language is used uh, by everybody and in, the, in any uh, situation it would be grade 5 and if it, it is not used grade 0. Then we've got uh, the factor number 5, response to new domains and media. Um, of course the ideal situation is when uh, the minority or endangered language is used in all new domains, for example in the internet when, uh, when it appeared and not the dominant language um, uh, or the language of other uh, other group, um, so it it would be a great five. Um, six factor materials for language education and literacy, and this is exactly the same thing. I I uh, I have problem with as with uh, um, uh, <coughs> scale. So uh, there is a. Um, a the question of uh, whether uh, written materi material is available and if it is used in the formal education. So scores are from zero, if no author orthography available uh, to the community, to five, if there is an uh, established orthography, a literacy tradition with grammar, dictionaries, text, literature, and everyday me media. So um, a part of this language um, uh, or written language is used in administration and education. So still we've got here uh, this uh, concentration on uh, the Western world which probably exclude at least some of uh, uh, languages or cultures that are connected with other languages. Uh, factor of seventh, the, um, governmental and institutional language attitudes and policies, including official status and use. Here we've got official external attitudes, not restricted to institutional protection. Great, uh, grades range from the prohibition of uh, <coughs> speaking minority language, grade zero, to official protection, grade five. And here also I would add not only like the official uh, status and uh, governmental or institutional uh, language and attitudes, but most of all uh, the attitudes of uh, community or dominant society towards uh, minority uh, group and towards uh, the use of minority language within the territory they are living uh, in. And probably it is, uh, um, I, I, I think, and according to my research, it uh, have much uh, stronger influence on uh, people's language practices than only like governmental and institutional uh, language attitudes, uh, which are also, uh, of course, important. Then factor eight, community members' attitudes toward their own languages. Um, and uh, of course, 
Um, here we've got uh, when, when people have very strong and positive attitudes, this is grade <coughs> five, and um, when they are ashamed uh, of uh, using the language, it would be uh, grade, uh, grade um, zero. And the last factor, it's amount and quality of a documentation. It is especially uh, important when we deal with the languages uh, which are um, dormant or nearly extinct and we have to uh, somehow help people to revitalize them or to, uh, to protect that it won't disappear. So uh, this is where the documentation of the language is especially um, important. So um, my, um, after a while when I was uh, dealing with the scales and I was using them as all we do, um, uh, there was something I was always looking for and missing in the scales. So how exactly the research are constructed, where from these data are uh, coming. So um, especially when I was reading um, the explanation or the description of languages uh, I knew and the communities I, I knew, I had this feeling that, well, these numbers are not really uh, um, sufficient or not, they, they, they are not really close to what, I've, uh, what I have in my mind when, uh, um, when dealing with, this, uh, with these languages. And I was trying to find a project which is dealing with ethnolinguistic vitality and which is uh, based on the proper research. So one of these kind of projects is European Language Diversity <coughs> for All. It is a project that um, it, it ended a few years ago. And it concerns, as you can see probably at this map, most of all the Baltic languages and uh, Scandinavian languages. Uh, but um, I think that uh, I, I found that uh, it, it was the, the methodology of this research was really interesting. So uh, the tool was the European Language Vitality Barometer, which was based on the idea of measuring the vitality of a language, which term of the speakers being able and willing to use the language, having the chances of using it in a wide variety of public and private context, being able to develop it further and being able and willing to transfer it to the next generation. So we can see that it is quite close to, um, uh, uh, to these scales and databases uh, that I uh, referred to before. But um, this, uh, this research was based on the concept of uh, COD, so capacity, opportunity and desire by to François. François Grain and François uh, Viancourt and um, so they, uh, they thought uh, that uh, language, for language to be used uh, uh, three different conditions must be met. So the first one is capacity. So people must be capable of using a language and um, what is interesting here, the capacity is, was treated in a kind of subjective uh, terms so it is not only the real competence of the language, but also speakers' confidence uh, of, uh, of their competences um, uh, of using this language, which is quite important because uh, sometimes we can have a very developed uh, skills in language, but we've got this feeling we cannot say anything and we will not uh, even try to, uh, to use this language because we've got fear, we've got kind of language barrier. Uh, the second uh, opportunity, so uh, not only of course the knowledge of the language is important uh, to use the language, but also uh, people have to have an opportunity to use it. And uh, it is like, um, uh, on one hand, this opportunity depends uh, on existence of a speech community because it would be very difficult to use a language when you don't have another speakers uh, to practice it or, or to, um, to talk with, uh, uh, with this person in, uh, in the language uh, um, we are talking about. But on the other hand, it is also the existence of institutional arrangements like legislation, regulations um, at school, workplaces, etc. Uh, so uh, um, all this sphere that uh, makes it possible 
for people to use the language or it prohibits them to, uh, to use it. And the third uh, condition which is uh, the most difficult to achieve and um, after years of, of my research I feel that uh, it is also the most difficult part in the language revitalization process is uh, uh, the concept of desire so uh, the sp speaker must also wish and be ready to use the language um, and of course it is reflected in the attitudes uh, of uh, toward the language uh, with uh, emotions with uh, um, uh, but also with all we can call the consequences <laughs> of linguistic trauma uh, of this person or other generation uh, who are using this language and also influence of different language uh, ideologies uh, with uh, which uh, speakers have to deal consciously or unconsciously. Uh, in this project uh, there was another, um, uh, another um, um, area, another factor, so language products or services that are available in the language. Uh, and here there were both material and immaterial materials like books, papers, web pages, news broadcasts, etc. But also, for example, uh, art or different forms of, um, of uh, transmission. So there are, there are four uh, areas, so um, opportunity, capacity, desire and language products. And um, language vitality is evaluated uh, along uh, four other dimensions. So legislation, whether there are laws which support uh, the endangered language or multilingualism in general, whether the speaker know about these laws and whether and uh, what they think of them. There is education, so all types and levels of education, both language classes, courses and uh, uh, the use of language in education, people's opinions, attitudes and feelings about education. So it is also important not only that education exists, but whether people want to uh, participate in it or not. There are media and also um, it relates to all types of media but also existence of minority languages and um, minority subjects within uh, majority uh, media and the last language use and interaction so what we can call language practices so how the language are um, is used in communication and social interaction in different situations with different people at, uh, etc. So what I really like within this research, and if you want to know, like, know it better, it is really, uh, uh, they've got a very good website and uh, you, you can have the questionnaire, uh, how they formulated the questions, because it is, all the research was based on, um, on the questionnaire and it was a very, very, I would say, developed questionnaires with, I don't know, 100 questions. So uh, it was only uh, a huge demand for uh, the language users to fill it and uh, it, um, they have to um, devote their times and attention to, uh, to use it properly. Mm, but then uh, the results were presented like this. So we don't have here the scale. We've got the very uh, difficult to understand grapheme with uh, different colors. And uh, so we've got these four areas. And then we've got uh, also these four dim dimensions uh, within which uh, the vitality of the language is evaluated in different areas and in different spheres. So, so to read this graphem and to know what is the ethnolinguistic vitality, um, uh, uh, we have to really analyze it before uh, giving people like the closed and ready uh, answer in what condition your language is. So uh, this is something that I really like because it is not um, like um, something uh, simple. It is not something that would allow um, other people, for example, those who are popularizing the research to just to neglect uh, the very complicated situation of this uh, community and uh, its, relations, uh, its relation with the language. 
So now I, I will, at, at, at the end of this presentation, I will go to uh, this, what, what was the subject of, um, uh, of it, so to ethnolinguistic vitality. Uh, I understand ethnolinguistic vitality as a group's ability to maintain and protect its existence in time uh, as a collective entity with a distinctive identity and language. So it is not about language itself, but it, it's about the language which exists in correlation with the community and not as an object that we can observe in isolation. So it is something um, that uh, is opposite to uh, the essentialized uh, concept of the language, which can be very often when we read about uh, language revitalization or any other processes concerning language endangerment, we uh, imagine the language as something that just exists, that we can isolate, that we can observe, that we can revitalize and then put it somewhere and people are, uh, uh, would start to, to use this language. But language never exists in isolation to, uh, to the community um, that is using it or not using it, that have some attitudes toward this language and some feelings about it and wants to use it or do not want to use it. So in that meaning, um, ethnolinguistic vitality assessment serves not to show really uh, rather to show the current condition of the language but most of all to help to uh, identify those areas in the maintenance and use of the language that need particular attention and support as uh, it was shown in this graph that uh, it is really something that sh uh, that is showing where the problem can be placed but not uh, to say well this language will die in uh, next uh, I don't know seven years or something so, uh, in, um, as such, the ethnolinguistic vitality assessment can be used as an important tool in the language revitalization process and it can be used as a tool by different actors of this process. From one hand, uh, by decision makers or language policy planners in taking a decision where direct, directing, for example, financial or political support, uh, which would be really the support for the community and for the language and not just a political gesture which, which, which with, uh, uh, we deal uh, quite often. It could be also be used by stakeholders to understand what risk the language is facing and um, most of all it could also influence individuals, so users of the language or potential users of the language to understand their, um, the situation of their language and maybe also to influence their like private uh, language practices or their like home language um, policy. Uh, so, uh, but for in any in any case, it shouldn't uh, be used for predicting the future uh, of the language, rather to show some tendencies. Um, but we have to remember that whether a language dies out or survives, it depends on a number of uh, individual decisions and very, very complex circumstances that may influence uh, the decision to use the language or not, uh, to, um, uh, not to use it. And as I, as I said at the beginning, also uh, this kind of statement or um, predicting language that can be dangerous for language in itself, for the revitalization processes, because it can also um, discourage people to uh, uh, take some activities or to um, um, discourage them to be strong in their uh, like language, home language policies or um, uh, the language choices. Um, that is why, so after saying all this, uh, w what I wanted to say that I, I think that uh, assessing ethnolinguistic vitality should be based on the proper research. And I think that here I, I, I wrote uh, sociolinguistic plus ethnographic uh, research, but I think that these uh, domains should be, it, it is not really distinct. I mean, it shouldn't be uh, distinct. Mm, mm, researcher must know uh, um, the field, must know the community, must know 
different aspects of uh, uh, of uh, of um, and problems with which uh, this community uh, is uh, is dealing, and I'm mm, I'm sure that there is a need of direct and in-depth contact with uh, respondents. And, um, and uh, here I will tell you just one story from the research project on uh, assessment of ethnolinguistic vitality uh, I carried out with uh, Claudia Soria. Uh, so it was like comparison of ethnolinguistic um, uh, vitality of two uh, regional collateral languages, so of Kashubian, which is in Poland, and Piemontese in Italy. Um, what, is, what was common for these languages uh, is that they belong to the same language family as the dominant language, and it uh, also produces kind of common um, problems for both these languages, especially with the status of the language, but also uh, with um, mm, uh, um, how to say it, with the social perception of, uh, of this language and what kind of language revitalization efforts are undertaken and what meaning do they got. Um, I will not go into details uh, to it, not to, not to, um, um, uh, to make my speech longer. I just want to, uh, to tell you one story. It was uh, um, we decided, as this project was uh, had a very, very small funds and uh, it was a short-term project, uh, we decided to provide a questionnaire. We constructed a questionnaire with about 30 questions and um, um, constructed quite um, similar to the Elgia um, project uh, I, I showed you and we wanted to uh, um, like it was our model uh, model project for this uh, what we did uh, we decided to spread the questionnaire among people we knew or to ask them to spread the questionnaire among their friends etc um, during this time I had to go to Kashubia for my the, the other uh, other things and I took some questionnaires with me uh, I, thinking that maybe I will have this possibility to spread the questionnaire and have some some more collected uh, forms. And uh, I met uh, the man, it, he was uh, the Kashubian man, like 80 plus, and uh, asked him to fill this questionnaire for me and he said, well, I, I would like to do it, but I don't have classes with me, so maybe you will sit with me, read the questions, and I will tell you what to mark. And I said, okay, I've got time. So normally, filling this questionnaire took about 30 minutes at most, between 20 and 30 minutes. I was sitting with the man for four hours, and it was the most... Um, one of the most important stories I heard from uh, a person uh, from the, the oldest um, generation, uh, any question from this form, which had like a very simple answer normally, uh, was uh, full of different stories about how it was, how it is, about hesitation also, uh, what kind of problems we are dealing with, even if there was a question uh, do you use the language uh, at street or in the supermarket or whatever? There was so many different situations that the language could be used or not and so many stories, the small stories uh, this man uh, told me that I, uh, and especially the questions concerning language uh, trauma or um, uh, the attitudes toward the language, which was really, I, I heard uh, the very, very difficult stories uh, from the past of this man and then um, it was a question I don't remember exactly how it was formulated but uh, did you ever suffer because of using the language and he told me like for I don't know half an hour the stories from his childhood how he suffered and then he said but you know it is better to mark uh, no and not uh, did you suffer no and uh, I realized uh, that um, all, the, all this data we have um, without, uh, like we are collecting and we create, we build kind of a picture 
of uh, language uh, vitality or of ethnolinguistic vitality. Uh, well, it gives us some ideas of in what condition the language is, but to understand really uh, what people feel about the language and um, how, uh, how complex uh, the language practices are, uh, it cannot be just a form. It, uh, there is a real need for uh, the ethnographic research and contact with people who, um, uh, who are language speakers, potential speakers, members of, of the community, etc. So from, uh, from this research uh, we had with Claudia Soria, we really felt this feeling that some factors of the research uh, of this scale or databases are overestimated and here especially the number of speakers and the existence of literacy form, literary form, um, uh, it, it was uh, also connected with the fact that we were dealing with the languages that are most, that were most of all functioning as a dialect. So um, it was uh, uh, the fact of using this language and using it in informal situations was, was much more important for these language users than um, uh, the literary form uh, and its existence. So um, also we thought that other uh, factors are underestimated, like especially people's attitude, desire to use the language and uh, experienced uh, stigma. Uh, the other things is concern also the situation um, I, uh, I tried to describe uh, through uh, the, my, my conversation with the, the, the old uh, Kashubian men. So um, the problem, as I, as I said before, with uh, assessing ethnolinguistic vitality is that it always influences uh, language conditions. For example, Sorbs are really afraid of any kind of research of any kind of sociolinguistic research concerning uh, their language's situation because they are afraid uh, that their funds would be cut, cut off. That uh, if Germans realize that the number of uh, Serbian language speakers is much lesser than they think, it would be very dangerous for them. So, um, and we as researchers have to also think that uh, no matter how, uh, for us it is obvious in what purpose uh, we are providing our research and uh, how we analyze the results with GUT, it can be also used by different people and sometimes it also can serve against, for example, the community we are researching. Uh, but also uh, um, the results can uh, uh, can influence uh, the users of the language in both directions. On one hand, it can discourage them, for example, to use the language, but on the other hand, it can like, give them the power. If they hear that the situation of their language is much worse than they thought, sometimes it mobilizes people. It is just important not to leave the results alone, but also to give them back to the community uh, we research and uh, um, like this is the role, the additional role of uh, of uh, um, of the researchers who are dealing with uh, uh, minority languages or languages that are endangered, uh, um, not to leave the community by itself to analyze uh, this research, but also to give them some feedback or some advices. I think it is my my perspective. So thank you very much, and if you have any questions, I hope I, I could uh, answer them. Thank you very much for your talk, and I think some good critical discussion of tools that a lot of people take for granted. Mm -hmm. I, you mentioned a couple of times very briefly, and I was wondering if you could tell us a bit more. You mentioned um, popular discussion or media discussion around Sorbian and endangered languages. And it, I, it wasn't quite clear to me, but is your concern that they are 
just taking these labels that say nearly extinct or extinct without thinking about the larger context and how does that relate to your work specifically? Well, I, I was rather talking about uh, the impact of general discourse of language endangerment um, that uh, it's, it's oversimplified the situation and that uh, many times uh, um, to, to make it attractive for people they, uh, they are like uh, they exaggerate or they, they, they give some very strong um, uh, 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 like statements about the condition of language which is never simple yes they, it, it, it is much easier and from the point of view of, of uh, for example media it is uh, much more effective to present the situation in the worst possible way, which also influence people's attitudes. And uh, concerning uh, Sorbian, if I mixed it, uh, it, it is probable that I had a, a very, uh, 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 like a, one example in my mind, it was a year ago, about a year ago, there was a talk of one uh, um, professor from Poland who came to, Kashu, uh, to, to, to Lusatia, where the Sorbs are living, and it was in, in the lower uh, um, Sorbian community. And he said, he gave a lecture stating that uh, all possible uh, numbers and uh, I don't know what else, states that lower Kashubian will not uh, 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 live more or exist more than next, let's say, 50 years. I don't remember exactly what, um, uh, what date he gave. And uh, it became uh, so, um, uh, so, so uh, hot subject of discussions among uh, not only lower Sorbs but also upper Sorbs in the Sorbian community in general uh, concerning on one hand um, uh, there were people who said yes I thought it is the end so, so what for we are putting all this money all this effort in this revitalization process in this language um, uh, preschool education immersive preschool education which is very difficult and we can see that results are not as we expected now we can understand it and there was this, uh, the huge disappointment which also we're dealing with this uh, kind of way of thinking that this is the end. So now we give up. It is the end. The professor said it's the end. So, so it is the end. But on the other hand, there was a huge, there, there was a, a group of language activists that um, that said n n not only it is not the end, and we cannot say that it is the end until we are living and there are people who want to do it, but who also said. Uh, we will prove him that it is not the end and uh, around this one lecture uh, that then became an article also in, in, in the Sorbian press there was a whole amount of actions that were taken on behalf of language of course uh, well it, it, it lasted for a few months yes this kind of uh, um, uh, movement around it but it, it is a good example to show how this kind of statement here it was also based on the authority of the professor it is something r even more because when you read in the popular press the language would die in the next uh, 10 years you you can say okay the journalist uh, doesn't know anything and uh, he just looked on some unesco databases uh, but he doesn't know the situation but this was stated by the professor who who was dealing with the problem of Sorbian uh, languages before. And uh, what he said was so strong that it created also the very different reactions from the part of the same, um, of the same community. So that is why I think that the responsibility of researchers and how they present their results is also very important. That's very true. I've, I've, I've been in the position myself of having my own comments, you know, kind of taken up and, and, and garbled as well. Yeah. So, yeah, so if I say I, I only know of, in the case of Guernsey, I only know of, say, five or six people under the age of 60 who can speak the language 
to a fluent sort of extent, and that's so, and, and, and then I kind of try and quite kind of qualify that by saying what I mean by that, but that of course gets left out, and then it gets garbled. So someone says, "Oh, well, such and so and so and so says, or latest estimates are that there are only ten people on the age of 65." I, said, I didn't say that, you know, <laughs> but this is what gets kind of then spread around, and you know, you have to be really careful. What interests me, uh, and it's something I think, don't think you really touched on, was the the question of how we count speakers, oh. and what does it mean to actually speak a language. And uh, it's it, uh, you, you did mention semi speakers, for example, but you know when, when we, one you, you do you did you say you did say you know how 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 do we know this? You know what data are we are we relying on? Where where are the surveys? Yeah. But, but also, you know, what does it mean to speak a language? Mm -hmm. So I think that this is something that for us in the project I, I had with Claudia Soria was uh, important, especially um, w when we tried to figure out what we don't like in, uh, in, in this kind of uh, um, databases or kind of research that uh, we know already, is um, that the most important here are uh, intergenerational transmission. and whether there are speakers. And speakers, when, when, when we hear speakers, we always think, so this is a child who spoke with uh, the parents in a language, so uh, it, uh, he or she is uh, the native speaker of the language, speaker, native speaker. But also, in, ca in the case of these languages we, uh, we are dealing with, so Kashubian, Piemontese, Sorbian, or other, most of uh, minority European languages now, we've got so different forms of, uh, of transmission of the language. We've got not only education, the formal education, but we've got a lot of different forms of informal education. We've got media, which is, I think, the subject which is also very interesting and um, from different points of view, because it is not only, th th there are all this movement of social media in minority <laughs> languages, which also influence people's, uh, like, uh, active language practices and there are different forms of uh, art or transmission through art or uh, uh, some other forms of communities that are creating, created on the basis of the use of the language even if it's not the native language for, uh, for speakers, for, for those who are participating in it. So, uh, of course, it is not, uh, it is, um, um, when I think about speakers of the language, I think, uh, that is why I try to say all, always speakers or potential speakers. So, those who are in the midway, let's say, those who can become the speakers of the language, even if they won't ever be the native speakers. They will be learners, there would be uh, na uh, new speakers, they could be semi-speakers or heritage speakers or whatever we call them, but from the point of view of language uh, revitalization, I think in many cases uh, um, they are the most important uh, force to push it forward. and. Uh, um, it is, uh, but it is also problematic, and it is uh, uh, problematic for all uh, all these communities I uh, I had contact with. Um, how to count speakers and whether these other forms of speakerness <laughs> should be counted or not? Mm -hmm. If uh, new speakers <coughs> or learners are really uh, speakers or uh, it is also the question of the relation between um, the language and identity and uh, identity and being a part of the community and if uh, um, becoming a part of the community is the natural process so something that you know we are um, we born with or you can become a member of the community even if you were born i don't know where <laughs> in, in a, on another continent so it, it, it's, it's true, it is very, very difficult question and very delicate questions. And I think that different communities also um, uh, with different uh, history, with different sociolinguistic situation and context in which they are dealing and different kind of language movements have different answers for, for this question also. 
think uh, uh, the community you're working in, Sam, um, mm -hmm. you know, it's it's not only intergenerational transmission yeah. that matters by any means. Yeah, uh, it's kind of community transmission, peer peer transmission. Um, people who use different languages for different purposes, so for different domains and all sorts of things, yeah. And also, well, you did speak a bit about it, the, um, like, how to define different speakers in different communities, but also particularly in the last point there, I mean, you uh, highlighted it as a methodological problem, but how to assess people's attitudes on a given territory, but also across territories as well, so I don't know if in your research um, for example, lots of Sorbian speakers live outside of the traditional yes. Sorbian <coughs> community yeah. area mm -hmm. and yes. being how to sort of relate. Yes. Them. Yeah, because the vibration is a huge factor. And, and we cannot neglect it. As, I mean, it is, it is something that uh, uh, it is also, it, it is like with, with, this, with speakers. I mean, I, I've got this feeling that it is much easier to research and to like think about the community or the speakers when we uh, when we attach it to the place and we think okay here we can uh, try to start this kind of the other kind of, on, of revitalization process because there are people who are living here and we can work with them but um, in any case We've got a lot of speakers or a lot of members of the community, potential speakers or whatever, who are not living inside of the community. And the problem is whether they've got influence on uh, the language maintenance or not. And I'm telling it because it is like uh, opposite also to this kind of thinking that the intergenerational transmission, which also um, in the scale of Fishman, this is this, uh, the sixth grade, yes, which, uh, are, uh, which is attaching intergenerational transmission and um, uh, use the language within the community, within, with members of the community, neighbors and uh, friends, etc. So, um, but what to do with this, all these new forms of transmission and uh, those speakers who are not really or not active members of the community, even if they, in their way of thinking, they are attached and sometimes also they use the language. This is a huge question which I think that um, um, also researchers start to deal uh, and start to work on this, even if it's very difficult. Uh, also, not only to, to measure it, uh, to research it, but also uh, you know, to say that, um, well, their attitudes and uh, their language practices could influence also the community which is somehow attached to the territory. It's a very, very interesting also uh, question. I was going to say something that's gone out of my head. <laughs> We were talking earlier, Christina, about things like the reliability of questionnaires and the yeah. need to do really in-depth yeah, ethnography. This is what yeah. I was thinking, I mean, about um, how to present the questionnaire and what happens in reality, because if we always go on the fieldwork thinking that we can, we, what we should do, but effectively what it happens is something totally different and we cannot follow always the pattern that we decided before. This is also one thing, you know, that we were discussing. But no, I was wondering one thing. Um, you said, uh, I totally agree when you say the language cannot be disconnected from the community, it cannot be taken as an object that should be observed. Um, and in order to evaluate what is the vitality of language within a community, we should also understand what is the attitudes of speakers toward the language. Uh, what I wonder is how can we know what is the attitude of speakers when we are inside a community um, of which we do not know at all the language. It is, I mean, we don't, we, we don't have any, um, we have to communicate through another language if possible or we have to rely to someone on someone else for communicating. So how to, um, how to deal with the 
the issue related to attitudes of speakers in a context where the field work is carried out in a community of which we do not know the language. Because we can, if we are in a, in a group uh, of which we know the language and we can communicate, we can present certain kind of questions and we can gather certain kind of information. But if it is uh, the first time that we are entering into a community and we have to learn basically the language and we have to describe the language so how can we gather um, the information useful for the description of the language the identification of the language without leaving uh, without forgetting what are the attitudes of speakers who, which help to identify the language i don't know that. i i can understand it perfectly and yeah, uh, perfectly <laughs> i would say uh, that my answer to this question is that after many years of uh, going there and having different contact with people, and so this is what I would call this in-depth research, uh, then you can start to form your opinions about it or, or some, some answers to this question. I, I, unfortunately, and it is unfortunately for all the research system with that <coughs> and the way of financing uh, research, etc., it is totally in the opposition, but I think that in this kind of social um, research, which are dealing with very de delicate subject and with the community, we have to know we've got to have a lot of time. And sometimes it is not even the knowledge of the language which is the most important, but um, like um, confidence of people you speak with, uh, that they can trust you, that they can uh, share with you some stories that they can uh, be with you, that you can observe uh, practices of these people. It is much more important that, you know, uh, the direct question, what do you think about something yeah. or what, it, what, are, what is your attitude? So I, I would say, and from my, this is my anthropological background maybe, which is, uh, uh, talking through uh, me now that uh, it is not possible to do it other way. It is. It must take a lot of time. So, uh, unfortunately for all us who have to deal with the short-term research funds and uh, the need to publish uh, all the results uh, after... This is before the end of July or whatever it is. <laughs> So uh, I, I can tell you that th there is also the problem with God now as the researchers that uh, there is no place to uh, to fail, like to have uh, uh, the project which uh, the results are n useless. And I think that to some point, uh, what um, in the project I told you about this comparison <coughs> about, uh, of uh, ethnolinguistic vitality of Kashubian and Piemontese was this kind of project, but it was a milestone in my uh, um, like a way of thinking about the research. So uh, the influence of this project on, on, on my uh, consciousness was much more important than the project which had the results I could publish. Here I would say that after three years of this project, we realized, and the last analysis we had is that Mm, uh, uh, we learned a lot, and if we start now the same project, we would do it completely different. <laughs> and and it was great to know it. I mean, it was such a fantastic feeling to be able to say we failed, but we learned something. And there is, but there is, normally there is no place for this kind of knowledge in no, I, I, in I our life. I, I try to say to students as well, you know, no is, a, is, is an acceptable answer to the research question. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, no, I was wondering about this, you were talking about, you mentioned the detachment of the language from its speakers, mm -hmm. and we're there we're talking about speakers of the language, but mm -hmm. what about non-speakers? Mm -hmm. Is it the language, do you think the language is already detached from non-speakers who might still identify with the community, like as a national identity maybe? but they don't speak the language of that community. Is the language technically already detached from them or do they still have some kind of connection <laughs> to it? So are you presenting mm -hmm. the language as an, yeah. a kind of, as an entity to yeah. them? Mm -hmm. Or, Interesting. Yeah, or yeah. Yeah, is it detached yeah. or mm -hmm. do they still have that connection because they are still part of the community? Well, I 
think it, it depends also on individuals, mm -hmm. but in general I would say that uh, um, until there is any kind of connection, even you know, only imagined connect connection, mm -hmm. uh, it is important. And um, for example, um, the uh, lower Serbian community. Uh, there are a lot of uh, um, the uh, this, uh, how to say it, the disruption of intergenerational transmission of Lower Serbian took place in 1930s. So we are dealing now with two or three generations of uh, of um, uh, like um, without the language, without the fluent transmission. Of course, there are some families who maintained this transmission, but uh, it, these are all really individual uh, families. But as a group, as a community, for many of people, uh, the relation to Lower Sorbian is still very important. So from uh, when I, uh, I was uh, talking with, uh, with uh, at least some of Lower Sorbs uh, who cannot say maybe a word, they, they, they know some, some, some basic words, but they cannot use it, they don't understand it, they even use German uh, when um, dealing with some folkloristic uh, uh, life aspects, so among, when, when there are uh, like uh, songs uh, sung for, for special occasions, most of them are sung uh, in German and not in the Lower Sorbian, but for them they were explaining me how important the language is for them. Mm -hmm. But then I went to the Upper Sorbian community and I was living with uh, people really who speak uh, Upper Sorbian. It was much easier for me because I am also a speaker of, uh, of Upper Sorbian. So mm, uh, when I was also trying to question how they feel about the relation between language and identity, uh, they were really often given me the, the example that, you know, uh, for us it is, uh, you cannot be Sorb without the knowledge of the language. If you don't know the language, you are excluded from community. And actually it was something I, I discovered that even uh, children in the school are often saying that, well, mm, mm, my grandmother was speaking Sorbian, she was Sorb, uh, my father, he's speaking only German and he's German, so my father is German. He wouldn't say my father is Sorbian who do not speak the language. But then uh, a lot of people say, but you know, it is not so uh, easy because our brothers, uh, the lower Sorbs, have this situation and for them it is important. So even on the, this kind of level, even if uh, I spoke with people who really identified the use of the language with being a member of the community uh, because of their knowledge of lower uh, sorbs and their situation, they could uh, uh, make this distinction that it is not like this for all. And um, I would say that this problem between, you know, uh, uh, the importance of the language to create the identity, it's also a very, very individual thing and uh, I would say that if not basing on the proper research on the community and here also the anthropological uh, uh, background uh, uh, is important, we cannot say that the relation between language and identity is such or such. It's, it's, it's very, very differentiated. I, I, I this word problematize again. Uh, I, I like to problematize the notion of community because you mentioned it meaning different things to different mm -hmm. people a lot and I think we tend to overuse it as a term yeah. um, and tend to essentialize it if you like. Um, and you've mentioned you know there can be widely dispersed communities, online communities, um, who belongs to a community is a fluid thing in different people's views. Mm -hmm. and, yeah, yeah, something to yes. think about. It's like the, the same problem with uh, the notion of speaker, <laughs> the community yeah, yeah. is... Uh, but even, I, I would say, maybe more difficult because we uh, overuse the term community. And uh, it, it is uh, like uh, very difficult to attach to any like precise <laughs> definition to it because we use it every time in any occasion. But yes, I, I think it is also very important to have it in mind when, when using this notion, especially when uh, describing like the speech communities. Yeah. Yeah. 
Well, thank you very much for your thank questions. You so and anyway, thank you. Yes. <laughs>